I'm a composer studying here. I have uh, this uh, research fund to do a project with uh, music, circus and science. I need to get information about plants in general and then I will use this to make music. You also know about the music of the plants, that the electricity is translated yeah. into MIDI information and then you can manipulate that. Um, so let's kick it off then. Uh, the sub-question of today is how can I inform my artistic decisions based on scientific research? Um, so welcome. Um, the first question is why is the study of plants important to you? Okay, uh, maybe I can introduce myself also. Um, I'm a plant biologist by background and I worked for several years as a researcher at the University of Florence and I perform lots of studies and experiments on how stresses can change the physiology of plants. So I wanted to see how plants react to environmental stresses, not biotic, so not uh, made by insects or living organisms, but basically from um, environmental cues, such as, for instance, uh, chilling, so cold temperature, heat, yep. uh, drought, absence of water, and mainly gravity also as a source of stress and because of that I had some project with the European Space Agency because I wanted to, to see how plants react during space missions. Mm. So I was very fascinated by that world and I eventually joined the European Space Agency to work there for four years. This is the reason why I'm now settled in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, as a project manager, so I conducted some experiments together with other universities on the International Space Station, just to see how biological systems can react to the external cues. And then I, I'm now at the Erasmus University College teaching plant biology and also other courses on sustainability. So having said that, uh, you, you can understand that plants are very important to me. I, I, I studied plants since I was at the university. And I think that a marvelous example of how we can uh, live on this earth with other systems compared to humans and animals. We, our mind is always anthropocentric or zoocentric at least. So we always refer to animals as the model systems for living on earth. But instead, I think plants are in a way smarter than us because for, for a lot of, of, of things, maybe we can also discuss that later if you want. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, maybe about the plant behavior. How does the plant behave in general yeah. compared to humans? Yeah. Uh, it's a nice question also because the term behavior is still under debate yeah. when we talk about plants. Uh, so behavior is widely accepted for animals. But remember that two centuries ago, behavior was not allowed to be used for dogs, for instance, or cats. Now we all know that pets have a behavior. If you, you have a pet at home, you know that this pet behave as we behave as humans. But for plants, it's still under investigation because again, they, they are a different system than us because they, they don't move because they stand still in a place and they are subjected to, to an external environment. So light, temperature, again, gravity and uh, wind and pathogens and so on, so they cannot move. And so they need to behave, so they need to change their physiology in order to uh, fight against these stress source or at least minimize the effect of stress. So again, they cannot escape, they cannot hide, so they, they, in that sense they are smarter than us because they develop a very intrinsic, uh, fine and efficient physiology in order to survive in this hostile environment. Think about plants living in deserts or in Mediterranean uh, environment where there is uh, very hot temperature during uh, the summer and drought, so absence of water. They still survive, they still flower, they still reproduce, they still produce seeds, for instance. Yeah, but uh, also humans are affected by all these stimuli that you mentioned, like lights, water, pathogens, nutrition, but there are some differences with the plants, as I understand. What, what are these uh, differences? Like, they survive better or what is They survive in a different mode because um, their physiology is 
before the episode, we need to talk a bit about the anatomy of plants. Mm -hmm. So plants are not um, as we are. So we, we, we have a skeletal, we have a secretory system, uh, as in mammals, for instance, birds as well. We have a system to control our temperature, so we can maintain constant temperature, for instance. Uh, we excrete toxic substances. Uh, we, uh, plants don't have a urinary system, they don't have a, a heart, they don't have a nervous system, but instead they can collect information around and they can manage this information and they can translate this external information into some inner information to be spread around the, around the, the plants. This is why, for instance, electric signal is also important for plants because they can spread around the plant signals from the external environment. Uh, now it's, it's established that plants are not individual organisms, but we can figure like a modular organism, so they are composed by repeatedly or repeated um, monomers, so um, let's say single um, mini organism, let's say, repeated one on top of each other, or a sort of colony, because the plants have lots of buds, for instance, buds are the tips of the stems and they allow to the plant to, to grow, for instance, so a lot of tips at the root level. So they have thousands, if not millions of different root levels. So they can explore and each apex can be considered as a single organism. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're a gardener at home, you know that if you cut the stem of the plant and you put this stem inside the ground or the soil, it can uh, produce its own root system. So per se, it's one organism. It can be detached by yeah. plant and can be can live uh, individual. Plant. And how about the toxins? How are they uh, getting out of the plant system? Yeah, a good question because plants again they don't have a urinary system exactly. or an excretory system, so they usually they collect toxins or they have two systems. One they detoxify toxins themselves. Mm -hmm. so they have chemical pathways in order to break down this toxin in order to be reused yeah. for their metabolism, or they store these toxins inside the vacuole. The vacuole is an empty space inside the cell. We don't have vacuoles, or very small vacuoles as animals. Plants have a very big vacuole. So mm -hmm. consider an adult cell has uh, more than 70% of the volume is a vacuole. It's an empty space. Mm -hmm. One of the function of the vacuole is to store these toxic compounds, which is also useful for plants because toxic compounds usually are bitter mm -hmm. and so when plants are attacked by insects or herbivores, um, of course, like we don't like uh, too much bitter mm -hmm. in our food, the same for insects. So they don't chew, uh, again, the leaves or other young stems because they are too bitter because they contain these toxic chemicals. Okay. So, um, are the plants communicating with themselves, with the environment, as humans or animals do? Yeah, uh, this is a trending topic in science. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the, the the best topic you can find now nowadays in plant physiology and science or ecology. Mm -hmm. Yes, plants communicate. Plants talk to each other uh, within the same plant, of course, because they need to communicate between the leaves and the roots. Consider that these are two different parts, completely different in terms of anatomy and metabolism. So these two different parts need to be in communication, but it's pretty easy to understand. It's less easy to understand how plants communicate with other plants of the same species, of different species, but also they communicate with animals or other organisms such as fungi and bacteria. Mm -hmm. There are uh, thousands of examples. For instance, um, root systems belonging to the same species but from two different individuals, two different plants, are in close contact one to each other through fungi in mycelium. The mycelium mm -hmm. is the filament of fungi, yeah. they call mycorrhizae. So these uh, fungi connect one root system to another root system and it's a win-win situation for them. It's called symbiosis. So 
fungi can get some uh, food from plants because pl uh, fungi cannot photosynthesize. So they cannot produce their own sugars. So these sugars come from plants. And in exchange, fungi uh, also spread the communication between one root system and another one. So for instance, through hormones or through chemical components. So th that's uh, well studied nowadays. And it's very important also for agriculture because nowadays we want to use this system to increase the performance of plants. Plants can also communicate uh, through the air, mm -hmm. through gas mainly, because they cannot speak like animals. So they do not, do, do not emit any sound. They respond to sound, but they do not emit any sound. Um, so in that case, the, the, the language is chemical, purely chemical or electrical, but electrical all inside plants, chemical between plants, but also visual, visually, because plants communicate with uh, insects by, especially beneficial insects, pollinators, yep. through colors, through shape, through different form. And that's very fascinating because they can attract bees, for instance, because they shape the flower in a certain way or they emit compounds, they have nectar in order to reward insects, they have a color which is different from the bee perspective because bees can only see the UV mm -hmm. light and so they call the, for instance, the, the uh, yellow color of a flower is seen as white color from the from the bee, and they see different signs in the on the petals in order to land on the on the flower. So it's very fascinating. So it's a sort of co it's called co evolution. So flowers and bees had evolved uh, together during these centuries and thousands of years. So plants communicate through mycelium, as you said, for my understanding. They can communicate in the root system. Mycelium, in the root system, they can communicate. Uh, they can communicate uh, with beneficial bacteria, for instance, in mm -hmm. the soil through chemicals. Yeah. So they can emit, uh, and this is still under investigation because it has been calculated that plants can emit more than ten thousand different chemicals at root level. So we don't know yet what they are. What do they do? Mm -hmm. We know that they are important to communicate with bacteria, beneficial bacteria. And this beneficial bacteria can suppress the pathogenic bacteria. So again, a win-win situation. But still, we don't know. Uh, it's re really fascinating because it's a wide uh, field for exploring what plants can, can do also for communication side. Yeah, so there are 10,000 chemicals in the root system, but also externally there are chemicals on, on the plant itself, on the upper part? Uh, on the upper part, less than 10,000, of course, but uh, plants can emit also, so they can produce and spread in the air different chemicals. You mentioned gas. Gas, they're called VOC, mm -hmm. volatile organic compounds. Yeah. So they are volatile form of gas, and these are the, the way plants can talk with, with other plants. So that are, the language, again, is chemical. So VOC, let's say VOC in the upper part and exudates, so uh, chemicals that can be released by root system. Yeah. Also, the plants in nature, they're not watered, like in the garden. We water our plants diligently so they don't die. But in the nature, how is the water provided? and how, how is the water affecting the plants? Yeah, uh, good question, because water is uh, essential for plants, because through water, plants can uh, absorb all the minerals they need from the soil. Nitrogen, phosphorus, the one we provide with fertilizers, for instance, in agriculture. So without water, plants cannot absorb nutrients, cannot survive because they don't have a skeleton, mm -hmm. they have a rigid, uh, cell wall around the cell made of cellulose, the same thing uh, for which paper is made, it's purely cellulose, and they use water in order to maintain their shape. So without water they will collapse, they will wilt, as we know from our plants at home. If we don't water plants, they start to bend and wilt. 
Um, how can they survive without drought, without water, so in drought? Plants have a root system, and the root system, among other environmental parameters, they can search for water. So they have each root apex, so the tip of the, the root, is able to detect the uh, content of water in the soil. Mm. So if that surroundings has little water, they can still grow in search for other water. Search, what do you mean by you search? Search means that, um, so they detect where water is, mm -hmm. the same for nitrogen, the same for phosphorus, the same for minerals. So they can direct the growth, it's directional growth. So they can um, use the resources of the root system in order to grow towards that direction. So they can stimulate the growth of uh, roots or uh, new root apics in order to increase the root surface, for instance. And they detect these uh, nutrients and water uh, in the proximity of the plant, or how far can that go? In the proximity. The proximity means a um, few millimeters yeah. from the root surface in an um, environment which is nowadays very important to study, which is called rhizosphere. Yeah. So the rhizosphere is the surrounding environment of the root, and it's a great ecological uh, environment because it's full of bacteria, for instance, or other organisms which are important for plants. So in that surroundings, plants can detect what's inside that specific environment. Yeah. So uh, I read the study about plants being touched in, a, in an experiment uh, and different uh, species reacted differently. So some of the plants died because they were uh, touched by humans, let's say 20 times per day for weeks and others, they just uh, didn't bother about that. So how are these plants affected by human touch in general? Because I don't know more about that, but maybe you know. Uh, yes, touch is another important stressor for the environment because plants can be touched by animals, by wind, for instance. Um, it is not the most important stressor for plants, but still they can react to that. I studied this um, when I was at the university back during my PhD because I made an experiment how to reduce the height of plants, mm -hmm. um, ornamental plants. Uh, I, I use a couple of different plant, ornamental plant species in order to reduce the height. You can reduce the height through chemicals, mm -hmm. but it's not very uh, sustainable for the environment, or by touch. And mm -hmm. I discovered that it's a um, pretty efficient method in order to reduce the, the, the height of plants. So plants have a reduced for that specific species, had uh, these species had reduced uh, growth because again it's a stress. But as you said, plants can react in different ways, so maybe another species is not affected for, for, for that. Usually, by touch, plants uh, have a detrimental growth, so they reduce their growth. Yeah, uh, there is a bright example, uh, which is a really great case study of how plants react to touch. It's called Mimosa pudica. It's um, a tiny plant with a compound leaf, and when you touch the when you touch the plant, the, the leaf, the compound leaf, the leaf tends to close in a very uh, sudden way. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a very fast uh, fast movement of plant, so this is why plants can also move uh, in a matter of uh, tenth of second. And so in that case, again, touch is a stress source, so they can also grows. The same thing happens to carnivorous plants. Mm. So if you if you know something about the Dionea muscipola, so the fly trap, minus fly trap. So the leaves are a trap. So the two leaves can also close when the leaves are touched by insect inside. They have a special hair inside this leaf and when the leaf is touched by insect, these leaves can close in a certain way, again, in a, the order of less than one second. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do plants behave differently in uh, permaculture compared to industrial agriculture? Yeah, good question. Um, first, we define permaculture. What is permaculture? It's, it's a, now it's a new way, but 
based on the old way to produce crops. So the industrial agriculture, as you said, is uh, basically monoculture. So we use the same species year after year in the same piece of land. And this is completely detrimental for the environment because plants then uh, don't have a fertile soil anymore. So there is no organic compounds there. There is no uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, so we need to provide fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides in a massive way. So permaculture, so back to the, the ancient way to produce uh, in a more sustainable way is there are different methods of permaculture, but basically it's based on using more plants, more species, different species in the same surface. They use a lot of organic matter, manure for animals, for instance, organic fertilizers, which are rich in nitrogen and organic matter, which is good for, for the air, for the soil. So plants react in a different way because uh, it has been convincingly seen that we don't, almost don't need to use pesticides and herbicides in that mm -hmm. way. Because when you grow plants with other different species, there is a sort of um, cooperation between species. Mm -hmm. So one species, for instance, is able to suppress pathogenic bacteria or weeds. So weeds are the bad plants we want to take out for our field. So these plants can help our crop species in order to grow and they can suppress weeds, they can suppress pathogens. In that way, we drastically reduce the use of pesticides, almost to zero. It's now well studied and the big problem is to translate these experiments or in a, from a small surface to the, the huge surface of industrial agriculture. So this is the, I think the big challenge nowadays of 21st century is to um, translate this knowledge to industrial agriculture. So let all our crops be under permaculture. So, and still challenging. Yeah, you also teach as Erasmus, as you said, uh, you, you teach food sustainability yes, and nutrition. I, exactly. I, yeah. I teach in two courses. I coordinate a course at Erasmus University College, which is called Food and Nutrition, but it's, and it's um, a wide course over how food can affect our health and our environment. And then another course at master level at Erasmus University about uh, sustainable food strategies. So it's more about food management and uh, how our entire food chain can become more sustainable. Plus, at the Erasmus University College, I teach also sustainable agriculture. Yeah, so my question is, because you have this background in teaching all these things, um, why is it so challenging to implement all this knowledge that we have from scientific studies into the industry? Yeah, uh, good question again. Uh, the big challenge is that sometimes it's hard to change suddenly a system which has been built for centuries. So the industrial agriculture starts from, uh, in specific case, let's say one century. So when synthetic fertilizers have been produced in Germany for the first time, so we were able to produce nitrogen fertilizers from fossil fuels. And in that specific case, we start using fertilizers and pesticides. We start to use specific machinery, tractors and plough and other, and other important machinery, uh, which was useful for uh, work population in order to increase the yield and increase food production. But at the end, we know that this food production is detrimental for the environment. How can we change this system? Uh, I'm not an expert in, in uh, food system, but I know that uh, some drastic change must be made. So consider that with monoculture, it's very easy to perform uh, harvest or sowing the seeds or spreading pesticides. When you have several species in the same field, harvesting become, uh, becomes uh, more difficult to achieve. You know? So in that sense, it's promising but something must be drastically changed. Yeah, so... And probably the, the climate change problems and global warming and the, the environmental problems we are facing nowadays, I think that will trigger 
sudden changes yeah. in, in a short time. This leads to my next question, which is about how plants are affected by climate change. Uh, before saying something negative mm -hmm. about how plants can be affected by climate change, I can say something before. Plants are affected by climate change, but they don't care about climate change. I can explain that. Because uh, plants can survive to climate change. Uh, probably they will change their uh, distribution, ecological distribution. And you know that some species are moving north to Europe. Maybe in, I don't know, 50 years, uh, Dutch, uh, the Netherlands will become a, a wine region, very important like France, because uh, the climate is changing what's in the Netherlands. But so plants can adapt to the climate change, to the changing environment. So probably some species will disappear in one part of the world, but they will then move to another side of the world. The big problem of climate change and plants is for those plants that are used to produce food, so for crops. So in that specific case, yes, climate change has a negative impact on those crops because probably we are not able to, or we will not be able to grow wheat and corn in Mediterranean regions in 50 years because it becomes too hot and too dry. So we need to change the way we produce. We need to change probably crops. So in that specific case, crops are uh, affected by climate change in a negative way. In a positive way, but not for us, uh, plants are positively um, affected by the rise of carbon dioxide. Mm. Because carbon dioxide is a source of carbon for plants for photosynthesis. So the more carbon dioxide they have, the better it is for our crops because they, they can produce more. This is what is done now in the Netherlands with the greenhouses. Yeah. So we can uh, fill in carbon dioxide inside the greenhouse more than the atmospheric concentration in order to feed, literally feed the plants with carbon. And this is what probably can uh, plants be happy about climate change. We are not happy about the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but plants can, in a sense, can be, can be happy about that. Yeah, you mentioned that plants are moving towards the north of Europe, and this is very fascinating information. Um, probably it's like a super slow movement towards north, but can you explain how are they moving exactly? Because for me, I don't see how that happens. <laughs> they can move in a natural way or artificial way. Let's put it this way. Okay. So natural way, they produce seeds, and these seeds are spread uh, via animals. So the animals can bring plants uh, where they move, through migration, for instance. And then probably these seeds will find um, a very inviting environment to germinate because it's not too cold anymore, so they can spread to, to the north of Europe, for instance. In an artificial way, for instance, us, humans. So instead of uh, growing corn and wheat in the south of Europe, then we bring our seeds to the north of Europe and there are wine or olive trees. So we start cultivating and grow plants in another part of the world. Yeah. But but, but migration has occurred through through thousands of years. So think about um, our crops have the so-called center of origin in different parts of the world. Maybe uh, you know that um, South America, Central America are the center of origin for avocado, tomato, pepper, eggplant, uh, some species of bean, and then through the colonization we bring them, we brought them in Europe, or cherries and plums and apples come from Central Asia, and through migration we moved these plants to, to Europe, so this always occurred in our history. Yeah. My next question is, would it be possible to use plants as an alternative source of energy, like renewable energy? Could they yeah, be used in that way? This is currently done. So biomasses, we call biomass the, uh, let's say, dead plant, the organic matter of plant. When they are dead, 
they can be either, either uh, left on the soil, which is good. So when you harvest your crop, you can leave the harvest in the soil, and this is organic matter that can enrich the soil again. So this is one ecological and sustainable way to make agriculture. Or we can remove the plants, and uh, we can use this biomass for energy. So this is what has been done for centuries, so we burn the wood, for instance. The problem is that it's not very sustainable because it releases ashes and lots of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. But we can use plants to, to make biofuel efforts. So biodiesel or bioethanol. So mm -hmm. we can run our cars by, let's say, fuel, not made by from fossil fuel, but made by plants. Again, we release carbon dioxide. This is not good for the environment. But remember that this carbon dioxide then is absorbed again, again by these plants, which then will become biomass, and then will produce biofuel and biodiesel again. Yes, we can use plants. And one uh, efficient way to use plants is to use, they're not really plants, they are other organisms, but algae. Mm -hmm. So algae are, a, in my opinion, is a great way to make our life more sustainable because they can produce biofuel, they can produce chemicals, pharmaceutical for us, also for our nutrition in a very sustainable way. They are, they can produce massive amount of biomass with lots of fats, for instance, or, la or lots of chemicals which are used in pharmaceutical, lots of vitamins, minerals, and so on. So they don't produce carbon dioxide, the algae? They produce carbon dioxide yes. because uh, they perform respiration like we do, mm -hmm. uh, but they photosynthesize. And they photosynthesize way more efficiently uh, compared to plants because the biomass is huge compared to the biomass. So per square meter, you produce a huge amount of biomass compared to plants. So algae, in my opinion, is the, the most sustainable way to produce something related to plants. Yeah. So you are the co-author of an article that describes the events in the electrical network of a maze. The study used a 60 channels multi-electrode array for monitoring the electrical activity. Now for me, which I'm outside the science domain, how can I measure the electricity of a plant in a simple way? Okay. In a simple way, we use sensors. Yeah. Uh, because plants um, emit electrical signaling mainly due to the depolarization of the membrane. So the cell membrane has a voltage difference between the external and internal side of the plant, or the, or the cell, or the membrane, and we can measure that. So in that experiment, um, we measure um, concurrent electrical signaling coming from different cells belonging to a root helix. Because we wanted to see if there was a synchronization of electrical signaling, trying to see if um, environmental stressor, in that specific case, was gravity, but can be applied also to, to other stressors like drought or low temperature or um, hot temperature. We wanted to see if an event in one specific cell can also be spread to adhesion cells. So the, to the cells close to the initial cells in order to see if there is a communication. And we saw that there is a communication within the root helix. So saying that um, a, a sudden event in a specific side of the root helix, in this specific case, or, or the plant in general, can also be spread through electrical signal mm -hmm. to the entire plant. But how can I do it, let's say, with yeah, less uh, scientific vocabulary in that way. Like, what can I do today if I have a plant at home? How can I measure the electricity? You need electrodes, mm -hmm. and um, you need a device which is able to detect the electrical. How is it called yes. the device? Uh, voltmeter. Voltmeter. Yeah. So I take that and two electrodes, and that's and two it. Two electrodes, and it's okay. It, it's not super scientific, but in a way you can measure at least if there is presence of electrical signal. So it measures like the resistance of it or? The voltage. The voltage. Which is not the resistance, yeah. Okay. 
Um, there are other reactions that I can measure. Um, I hope you mean. Yeah. Other reactions of plants. Uh, the problem with plants is that they have a different timeline mm. than us. So usually we have a sudden response. Uh, plants usually don't have this sudden response. I'll make you an example. They can, you can measure the response to light, directional light. So if you put a plant in front of the window where the light comes from one direction only for weeks or months, you can see that the plants start growing towards the source of light, mm. right? But this is not happening in seconds or minutes. It takes days. You know? So you can measure the reaction of plant because this is a reaction, but it takes a long time to measure. What is currently done in research is to use time-lapsing to see the reaction of of plant to an external stress. So, so you take a picture every, I don't know, every second or every minute, and then you create a movie and putting together all these pictures in time, time lapse fashion, and then you can produce, or, or you can see, you can detect how plants move during this time. Yeah, in the same study, uh, you use calcium and uh, another chemical, but I don't remember named glutamate maybe yes. yeah and uh, this affected the electricity in the plant How, what can i use at home to increase this electricity in a plant let's say uh, good question uh, in this specific case um, of course this is not a living uh, setup but it's made in the lab so it's made with uh, sterile conditions for instance it's made in a petri dish which means that there is a a substrate inside where we, you can add different concentration of calcium and glutamate because calcium and glutamate can also increase the depolarization of the cell membrane and are used by plants in order to create electrical signal in a faster way. At home, it's, it's quite difficult to uh, increase electrical signal in that way. You can try um, by using not uh, pure water, to uh, uh, wet the plant, so to water the plant. But you could probably use a saline solution, so with salts inside, but be aware that too much salt is uh, negative for plants because they will die because of salinity. But you could try by using different concentration of salts inside, inside the, the water solution. And can I observe? the electricity with the, the device that you mentioned? With the device, I, I, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think you can measure the difference in, uh, in this voltage spread. Yeah. So in the publication Biotechnology Progress, Dr. Hans van Eaton reported that electricity can be used to elicit chemical production in plants instead of toxic materials. Uh, is it a good idea for me at home to electrically stimulate a plant? Yeah, um, I didn't know that article, by the way. Thanks for sharing because uh, it was really interesting to read how electricity can also stimulate uh, the production of chemicals. So let that makes in simple words. Plants can produce uh, chemicals, different chemicals, uh, thousands of different chemicals. You can elicit, elicit means you can trigger, you can stimulate the production of these chemicals via other chemicals. And the example in the book there was uh, copper chloride, for instance. What's the problem? If you use another chemical, then you need to take out the, the chemical you added from the chemical you want to elicit in the plant. Mm -hmm. So you collect the chemical you wanted to elicit, but that's polluted, let's say, yeah. with the other chemical. So this is a smart way in order to produce the chemical you want without affecting the quality of the chemical. Because with electrical signal, electrical signaling, of course, it disappears in milliseconds and then you don't have any disturbance in your chemical. And yes, uh, apparently with the electrical signal signaling, you can stimulate the production of, of chemicals inside plants, which can 
probably be used also to increase tolerance of plants to bacterial attack, pathogen attack. So maybe, I don't know, in, in our fields, we can see plants with some electrical wires in order to stimulate plants in order to produce compounds in order to fight against pathogens. Yeah, how should I do it? I take, for example, some copper wire and I put it in the earth. What do you think is a good method? Uh, good method could be to insert copper wire in a plant and uh, to the ground mm -hmm. and send an electrical signaling through a battery, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And what species of plants would you recommend to work with? Uh, for the electrical signal? Yes. Um, I would say not woody plants. So woody plants means uh, plants that have uh, wood and bark, mm -hmm. because then it's, it's pretty difficult to insert uh, electrodes inside a plant. And also, as far as I know, the electrical signaling moves through uh, young tissues. So the, the highest velocity of electrical transporting plants is when you have young tissues. So no, young tissues means less than one year. Mm -hmm. The green one, the soft one, the, the wet ones. Uh, so if you are going to use woody plants, I think that's not going to work. Yeah. So you can use, for instance, um, I know that lots of plants are made with bean plants mm -hmm. or pea plants mm -hmm. because you the, um, you can easily germinate a bean plant or pea plant from seed. Yeah. And then these are very soft, they're not very tall. And you can easily use them at home. Okay, thanks. In your lab. Yeah, I was thinking about hydrangea. Hydrangea is an uh, ornamental plant. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are different families of hydrangea, some of them are called annual hydrangea, so you need to cut them, prune them mm -hmm. back, and so they release uh, young shoots. So you could, you could use those pieces of hydrangea because they have uh, soft tissues, but if you use the other category of hydrangea, which is the most common, the one is a shrub, it's a bush, mm -hmm. and it's too woody to be used. Yeah. for your purpose. But you, you could use the the, um, uh, the category is called annual hydrangea. So they, are, they still have a perennial and permanent root system, mm -hmm. but they uh, sprout every year a new stem. And that stem is pretty uh, soft and young. Yeah, I will look into that. So why hydrangea? Why? Yeah. It, because it was mentioned in the study that it behaved... Uh, it responded well to touch, let's say. And okay. Then I learned about this plant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I left some room in our discussion for uh, maybe a material that you brought about electricity. And if you uh, can talk about electricity in plants for a few minutes more. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, still uh, under investigation uh, field because it's not well known as animals and humans because Electricity in human, we, we all know that it's uh, spread through a nervous system. Plants do not have a nervous system. They don't have neurons, they don't have axons. So the big question uh, was uh, the start of the last century. So this study started in the beginning of the 20th century, about 1900. And so the big question, how plants can spread the electrical signal? So then we know they produce electrical signal, how can they spread? And now it's well established that they spread this electrical signaling through specific tissues, which is called phloem. Mm -hmm. And the phloem, basically it's very simple to explain, it's that pipes and tubes mm -hmm. that connect leaves to the root system, and usually used by plants in order to move all the sugars produced inside the leaf through photosynthesis to the other parts of the plants. Now we know that these uh, flowing cells are alive and they are in close contact with other cells which are called companion cells, which help the flowing cells in order to work properly. And we know now that the electrical signals are mainly 
spread through this combination of flowing cells and compact cells. Still, we don't know how plants can detect and uh, translate this signal, you know, because uh, every signal must be um, uh, transduced and then translated into an info, an information. This is what happens with computers, for instance. But we still don't know how plants can actively uh, translate and transduce this signal into an information. So, uh, what's useful for plants? Now, under stress, they produce, as we we saw, for instance, under gravity, they produce this massive electrical signaling at the beginning of the, the stress, but then we don't know which kind of info then is used for, for plants. If they produce a chemical, if they uh, change the growth pattern of cells and tissues. So this is a great field now for investigation. Yeah, and you also said something about uh, synchronicity in uh, on the cellular level in the plants. Does it have a meaning, this synchronicity? It has a meaning. It has a meaning because through synchronization, so it's not important. Synchronization means that there is a signal that goes in waves. Um, for plants, it's not important the amplitude of the wave. So for instance, uh, chemicals, calcium, for instance, is sent out uh, in a waving form. Uh, so it's not important the amplitude, so it's not important the quantity of calcium that is sent out, but it's important the uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. So the frequency of this wave. According to the frequency, so when the waves are uh, more close to each other or uh, more distance one to each other, plants can detect if there is a change in, in the system. So the, the frequency in this specific case is very important for plants. Synchronization means that different events can synchronize together. So they have the same frequency. And having the same frequency means that it's a good source of information because if the frequency is not, uh, doesn't collimate and, and has uh, different um, frequency, this is not a good source of info. But when the frequency is the same, we can have a, a, a plants can have information. Okay, yeah. Um, so we have a few questions left. For example, what can we do as regular persons to combat the, the climate change? What we, we can do now, um, I think that every person on Earth can contribute to decrease climate change just by small changes in our day, daily life. Uh, you know better than me, biking instead of driving a car, uh, choosing food responsibly, mm -hmm. because also we can have an impact on, on climate change just by changing our diet, yeah. less meat for instance, and go for more vegetarian choices or even vegan choices. But in that specific case, if you go vegan, you need to be careful for something that is missing in our diet. Um, we could uh, use second-hand clothes, for instance, instead of um, newly uh, built clothes. You can go for organic food, even if you if you don't want to become vegetarian or vegan, but you still want to eat meat, go for use for organic meat, which is, has a lesser impact, still huge impact on the environment, but a lesser impact on the environment. Uh, use uh, less electricity devices, use more um, renewable energy sources. If you're at home and you, are, you want to use energy in your energy company, be sure that this energy company uses sustainable uh, resources like wind energy or solar energy. We can install or solar panels at home. I think we can we can do a lot all together. We are 16 million people in the Netherlands, so if we, in a similar way, we make a choice, 16 million, or the same choice, let's say uh, eating less meat, can make a big, a huge difference. Yeah. So after this meeting, I will be more positive because in the Netherlands everybody bikes. <laughs> uh, apparently in Codarts everybody is either vegan or vegetarian or eating organic. So 
Yeah, that's encouraging. Yeah, this is what also, by the way, Erasmus University is trying to do. Maybe you read something in the, the, the news in the last days that um, in our campus, in the eastern part of Rotterdam, there is a whole food plaza with lots of cafeterias and restaurants there. And the idea of Erasmus University is to uh, go vegan by 2030, start with only providing vegetarian choices and a little of vegan choices, and then have a transition towards vegan options only in campus. So uh, the idea is to take out meat from uh, students' diet, let's say, yeah. at least without providing meat to them just also to educate people to consume less meat because you can eat delicious recipes yes. without eating it. Yeah. Do you know someone else connected to this topic that I'm investigating? Maybe a hydrologist or a geologist? Um, yes, I can put you in contact with a professor in Florence I work with and he's very famous in Italy because he's um, also a writer of uh, scientific books, but for uh, general people, for the general public. And he studied electricity in plants since uh, maybe 30 years, because it was the topic of his PhD at that time. He's older than me, so his career at the university is pretty long now. And he knows a lot about electricity. Yeah. Plants. So his name is Stefano Mancuso. If you Google it, uh, you can find lots of his books also in English language and Dutch language. Yeah. He's really fascinating. I will check him. Yeah, thank you. And last question is, could you recommend some materials to check? You mentioned this guy already. Yes. Something else to check? Um, the risk is to check scientific articles, which are too scientific. So the... My suggestion is to check maybe some reviews on some journal like Nature, for instance. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can send you also some some names of of uh, journals or frontiers in plant science or or this kind of stuff. But sometimes you can find nice articles, and I use a lot in my courses from newspapers. Oh. For instance, The Guardian or New York Times or Washington Post, they have a nice science section and you can find brilliant articles. They are mainly about sustainability, about food, but also sometimes they talk about plants and the, the behavior of plants. Yeah, okay, I will check it. Well, that's the end of the interview. Thank you so much, Dr. Thanks Sergio, for, for coming. Me. Yeah, and uh, for sharing all this beautiful information with me. It's that been a pleasure. Okay, so uh, yeah, to be continued maybe. Yes.